And everybody said, Amen. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together, your children, sons, daughters, your servants, leaders. We're asking, Lord, that today you explain, reveal your mind to everyone in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, as your children, as your servants, we receive what you have to say to us with honor to the Heavenly Father in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Already, you know, we're studying tonight from Genesis chapter 42 all through to 45. We're looking at Genesis now chapter 45, reading from verse 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Look at verse 5, now therefore. Be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that he sold me thither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Verse 6 For these two years have the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be airing no harvest. Verse 7 And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8 So now it was not you that sent me hither but God and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. In verse 9, his chief, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus says thy son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, and tarry not. Ten. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. And thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. In verse 11, And there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. As we read in those verses, you realize something that Joseph actually believed his interpretation. He said, Two years of famine are past, and there remains five more years of famine. There are preachers who don't believe what he preached. There are readers of the Bible who do not believe what they read. There are interpreters and uh, there are people who try to counsel and they do not believe what they have interpreted, what they have counseled, what they have, they have advised and what has been revealed unto them. Joseph believed that as God has said, there will be seven years of famine and that two years have passed, five years of famine must still come. Now, as we look at that one, Joseph himself was preserved during that time of famine and all the people of Egypt that he ruled over. They were also preserved. We're looking today at the message, the preservation of the righteous in famine. In Psalm 37, 
reading from verse 17, Psalm 37, verse 17, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous, the righteous, the righteous. Verse 18, in verse 18, the Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Verse 19, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine, they, the righteous, shall be satisfied. And so as we look at these chapters, we're looking at the preservation of the righteous in famine. Three things we're looking at. Number one, con for the famine of the world. Number two, conscience at the foundation of our works. Number three, concern of the Father and uh, his worries. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at corn for the famine of the world. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 56, and the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed so in the land of Egypt. Verse 57, it says, And all the countries that came to, into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so on all lands in the world of the world there was great famine all over the world then in chapter 42 verse 5 chapter 42 verse 5 and the sons of israel came to buy corn among those that came for the famine was in the land of Canaan chapter 43 verse 1 it says and the famine was saw in the land in verse 2 it says and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt their father said unto them go again by us a little food chapter 45 reading from verse 6 it says for these two years as the famine been in the land and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest verse 7 verse 7 says and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance reading from verse 8 in verse 8 so now it was not you that sent me hither but God and he has made me he the God of heaven the God that gave the dream originally he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Corn. The famine for the famine of the world. Three things. Number one, the cause of famine in our world. Not just in the world, in our own world, around us, encycling us, the cause of famine in our world. Number two, our consecration despite the famine in the world number three our confidence during famine in his world look at number one the cause of famine in our world is the famine in your own world around you in your community in your family in your personal life is there any famine there? We must discover the cause before we can find the cure. We must know what has brought this in my world. The pain, the suffering, the scarcity, the hunger in the famine I find in my life. The cause of famine in 
our world. In Second Samuel chapter 24, reading from verse 10, and David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. David had done something and his heart smote him. When we do something that is offline, that is of the word of God that is uh, in disobedience to the word of God and we didn't listen to our conscience we didn't listen to the word of God we do something that is wrong and then our hearts smite us we told David's heart smote him he was a king he was a ruler he was a leader a minister a pastor a singer a composer with all that our position does not excuse us from obeying the word of God. And when we do what is wrong, our heart will still smite us, convict us. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done, in that which I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant for I have done very foolishly. When we go against the word of God, the wise God, he is wise. When we contradict his word, we're fools and we have done foolishly. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, to so God, the prophet came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in the land? The cause of such famine is the sin, the foolishness, and the filthiness of the one who is going through that famine. Or will thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there, there be three days pestilence, pandemic in thy land. Now advise and see what, I ans I, what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And then we read in verse 14, it says, And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of men. For Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. Then came David to Nob, and then were told, David came to Nob. And the priest and the Amalek was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why comest thou hither? You see, I'm hesitating there because that's not the verse I was looking for. Well, let's just move on. What? brought famine was the wickedness of the house of Saul that Saul had killed the people that Israel had made a covenant with and a sworn that they will not be touched and yet now they did what they shouldn't have done and a famine came upon them we're looking at jeremiah chapter 44 and i'm reading from verse 16 jeremiah chapter 44 verse 16 as, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the lord we will not hearken unto thee and then verse 17 the first part there but we will certainly do that whatsoever, whatsoever sin goeth forth out of our mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. 
as we have done, we will, we will do a fathers, a kings, a princess, and in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals of food, and were well, and saw no evil. They said, as for the word that you have spoken, we will not listen, we will not hearken unto you. They said, we will surely do that which has gone out of our mouths. That's what they said. They said, we hear the word of God. We're not going to abide by the word of God. And we're not going to stay with the word of God. They said, whatever has come out of our mouth, that we will do. What well, the consequence of that? Look at verse 27. In verse 27, there, it tells us very clearly what was going to happen now unto them. Because of they are deliberate looking away from the word of God and wanting to have their own way. It says in verse 27, Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the farming that's the cause when they said we push the word of god aside and we're going to do that which has come out of our own mouth god said is that so then a famine will come upon them in second samuel chapter 21 second samuel chapter 21 we're looking at verse 1 then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul. Remember, Saul had died. He's gone to his place in eternity. And yet, because of what he had done before he died, it is for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. What we do in life, the consequences are there. Even after we have gone, the consequences will still be there. It was the cause of the famine. We're told in Amos chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 4. Amos chapter 8 verse 4, hear this. O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. There is seeing uh, this family was coming now upon the people at the time of this prophet Amos is because the people that were rich, the people that were well placed, they were oppressing uh, the people under them. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, and they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, the bread of life, and shall not find it. Let's come to number two. Number two is the consecration we should have despite the famine in the world here we are in the world there's pandemic on the one hand pestilence on the other hand and uh, poverty and joblessness and uh, and famine everywhere recession what do we do as believers at such a time like that in romans chapter 8 reading from verse 35 here is our commitment here is our consecration who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution 
or famine. There are people that drop their love for God and love for Christ and love for the word of God and for the work of the Lord just because, well, you know, I'm seeking for a job, I don't have a job yet Just because I don't have enough to eat Just because I'm not married yet Just because I don't have any children yet And because of the need in their lives Instead of looking to the Lord God Almighty They rather forsake their love for God And their love for the things of God But they said, Paul the Apostle said of himself And of the Roman believers who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword in verse 36 as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter and then it says in verse 37 nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us uh, some believers isolate that verse they pull that verse out they cut that verse out from the context it's saying that even when there is famine even when there is oppression even when there is persecution in all these things we are more than conquerors we do not allow those things to separate us from the love of god nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us in verse 38 it says for i am persuaded that neither death the death of a loved one the death of somebody very close not even that nor life the privileges we have in life no angels no principalities no powers no things present no things to come in verse 39 no height no depth no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord is saying that we keep on committing ourselves to the lord whatever comes whatever leaves whatever we have and whatever we lose look at number three here number three we're looking at our confidence during famine in his word our confidence during famine our confidence in his word in genesis chapter 28 verse 15 and behold i am with thee jacob the lord had given promise to abraham he had given that same promise to isaac and then he transferred it to jacob and so whatever comes and whatever goes whatever happens and whatever does not happen God says, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And even though there might be famine, there might be scarcity, there might be recession, there might be pandemic, there might be persecution, there might be things you don't understand. Yet, the believer, the righteous, should hope in the Lord and depend upon the word of God that cannot fail. The Lord had said to him, and behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all the places where that thou goest. And I will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which i have spoken of to thee of i will not leave thee i will not forsake thee until i have done everything i've spoken to you of we should rely on that word believe in that word even though there is famine even though there is an upturned situation in our lives we know that god is god and because god is god 
he will do what he said he will do job chapter 5 we're reading from verse 19 he shall deliver thee in six troubles yea in seven there shall no evil touch thee he will deliver me in six troubles yea in seven there shall no evil touch me amen for me for the pastor amen for the preacher how about you it shall deliver you in six troubles yea in seven there shall no evil touch thee so if you know that you will come to the meetings when you ought to come to the meetings you'll not be a person of a mind double thinking maybe maybe i look at the sky can i go out now i look around can i go out now i look at you know the news and they say this and they say that can i go out now yes you can i said yes you can you know don't dress up your hand but there are you know some of our leaders and some of our workers and some of our members that didn't go to the gck at ecorodu have you heard about ecorodu this 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 i will watch online i don't think i can go to ecorodu i went i said i went and I came back safe. You always go and you come back safe in Jesus. Name. We don't need to fear. Our time is in the hands of the Lord. Our protection is in the hands of the Lord. Our provision is in the hands of the Lord. Because even if there are seven troubles, the Lord will not allow them to touch you. Look at verse 20 there. In verse 20, in farming, it shall redeem thee from death in war from the power of the sword. In verse 21, it says, Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. And then in verse 22, it says, At destruction and famine, thou shalt lie neither shall thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth in psalm 37 psalm 37 reading from verse 3 trust in the lord and do good so shall thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed thou shalt be fed in verse 4 it says delight thyself also in the lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart verse 5 commit thy way unto the lord trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass he'll bring it to pass in your life in verse 6 it tells us and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noon day then it tells us in verse 7 rest in the lord and wait patiently for him fret not thyself because of him that prospereth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass in verse 8 it says cease from anger and forsake wrath fret not thyself in any way to do evil verse 19 they shall not be ashamed in the evil time in the days of famine they shall be satisfied you will be satisfied 
the Lord will not forsake his own at the time of famine the Lord will take care of everyone we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27 behold I am the Lord the God of all flesh is there anything too hard for me verse 36 in verse 36 and now therefore thus says the Lord the God of Israel concerning this city whereof ye say it shall be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence even in that condition the Lord will protect and preserve his own Look at verse 39 there In verse 39 it says And I will give them one heart And one way That they may fear me forever And for the good of them And their children after them In verse 40 Verse 40 says And I will make an everlasting covenant with them In spite of the famine Despite the famine That I will not turn away from them To do them good good even during that farming but i will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me in the times of farming or pestilence or persecution or trouble or trial we will not depart from the lord in jesus name we're coming to point number two here point number two conscience at the foundation of our works we're coming back to uh, genesis chapter 42 and we're reading from verse 13 genesis chapter 42 and we're reading from verse 14 and they said the servants are 12 brethren the sons of one man in the land of canaan and behold the youngest this day is with our father and one is not they said count us we were twelve we are ten here now plus the one or two of the father eleven and of the one that is not twelve who was the one that was not I said, who was the one that was not? Some people might think you are not, but you are. You are there. They said, they taking the name of one out of the land of the living. They said, he is not. Not just that he's a slave not just that is in poverty prison somewhere it's not but he is you are there where god says you will be even when they say because of the work of their hand they thought they have the final say no man reuben Simeon, Levi, no man will have the final say in your life. Yeah. You'll still be there. Yeah. And eventually you'll tell them, I am, what's your name? Are you ashamed of your name? You'll be there in Jesus' name. Conscience at the foundation of our works. So we're looking at three things here. Number one, the seared conscience of habitual sinners. Number two, the smitting conscience of harmful self centeredness. Number three, the saints' conscience with honest sincerity. Let's look at number one. Number one, the seared conscience of habitual sinners. Uh, let's go to chapter 37 and we're reading from verse 31 and he took Joseph's coat and killed a cage of goats and did the coat in the blood. Verse 32 and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said this have we found 
know now whether it be thy son's coach or no you know the story already they picked up joseph they put him in the pit they removed the coat of many colors they killed the kid a goat and then they dipped the blood they dipped the coat in the blood and they sent it to the father and they said see whether this belongs to your son or not and then they sat down to eat can you think of that that these people that did such a thing to their brother they had such a settled mind a set mind they didn't feel anything at all even when joseph was pleading with them yet they couldn't feel anything their consciences all of them seared as with a hot iron look at chapter 42 of genesis chapter 42 reading from verse 21 and he said one to another later now we're very guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul my brothers don't do this to me my brothers don't take my coat don't send such a coat in blood to my father he was in anguish and they said we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear therefore is this distress come upon us in verse 22 and reuben answered them saying speak i not unto you saying do not sin against the child they sinned against joseph but at that time they seared their conscience they sealed their conscience they wouldn't have any feeling and then it says and ye would not hear therefore behold also his blood is required in verse 23 and they knew not that joseph understood them and joseph did not tell them i hear you i'm bilingual i speak the language of egypt i also speak the language of canaan everything you are saying i can hear he didn't show them that he heard now the seared conscience was troubling them we're told in first timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 1 first timothy chapter 4 verse 1 now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times the time we're living now some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils verse 2 in verse 2 it says speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron in the last days there will be church goers there will be religious people that do evil things sinful things habitually and they do them and their conscience will not prick them because their consciences are seared if anyone dies in such habitual habitual sinning and the conscience is seared that person cannot will not get to heaven whatever the profession i'm saved i'm sanctified i'm filled with the holy ghost but he lives a lie he lives in hypocrisy and his conscience is seared he can do evil and see other people suffering and yet his conscience will not feel it at all in ephesians chapter 4 verse 19 in ephesians chapter 4 verse 19 will be past feeling of giving themselves over unto lasciviousness to walk on cleanness with greediness look at no conscience in harmful self-centeredness the people that labor only for themselves if they hurt another person and it gives them joy all they care about is their own joy and their own desires 
and what they like to do. They like to oppress other people. They know that that thing will pinch and prick and it will cause pain to the other person. All the same because they are not sanctified. You know, sometimes you hear many people saying, I'm sanctified, I'm sanctified. And they do not understand, they do not know the meaning of sanctification. Their heart, their life, their behavior, their action in causing pain to other people and they never have any feeling. Their conscience does not smite them. It shows if they were saved at all, there's no sanctification there. They do not have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They can quote holiness. They can read the Bible. They can show the verses, holiness, 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 without holy, because I am holy. But their action, their disposition, their behavior, their conduct, the things they do to hurt other people, they don't have any feeling. Their own purpose of oppressing other people is more important to them than the pain they are causing other people. The smitting conscience in Harmful self centeredness. We're looking at chapter 42 of Genesis and we're reading from verse 27. And as one of them opened the sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money, for behold, it was in the sack's mouth. Look at verse 28. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored. And lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart filled them. And they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God has done? unto us look at verse 35 in verse 35 and it came to pass as they emptied their sacks and be, and that behold every man's bundle of money was in a sack and when both they and their father saw the bundles of money they were afraid now their conscience with them everyone has conscience some conscience are dull and some are seared and some are awakened and some are alive uh, the people who uh, take uh, the word of God for granted and on the meeting days they hear the word of God on the ordinary days when they go back to their office they don't apply the word of God when they get to their families they don't apply the word of God and when they get to their communities they leave the word of God in the church where they have heard it but the word of God does not affect their life their heart their conscience but everyone has conscience on the final day the conscience that has recorded everything will relay everything back to us in romans chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 15 romans chapter 2 verse 15 we show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another in verse 16 in verse 16 in the day when god shall judge the secrets of men by jesus christ according to my gospel in numbers chapter 32 verse 23 numbers 32 23 but if ye will not do so behold ye have sinned against the lord and be sure no doubt about this and be sure you may be careless now you may be carefree now and you may do whatever you want to do now and enjoy sinning but be sure your sin will find you out let's look at number three number three is the saints conscience with honest 
sincerity. We're looking at Acts chapter 24, reading from verse 16. And here do I exercise myself to have always a conscience, void of offense toward God and toward men. Herein do I exercise myself, apostle, preacher, pastor, evangelist, prophet, teacher. The office will not take anyone to heaven. It is what we do with the word of God we're preaching, the word of God we're teaching, the word of God we say we believe. And so the apostle said, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. And there are things you are hiding from people. Your conscience tells you that's wrong, that's sinful, that's bad, that's evil. And yet, you keep on doing it once you can hide it from people. And you do not believe in God that God can see you and God can evaluate everything. Paul the Apostle said, you know what I do in the day, in the night, in the public, in the private, anywhere? This is what I do to always, every time, have a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward men. It tells us in First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. But now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Good conscience. Why? Do we have to maintain good conscience? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 from verse 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're looking at verse 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're reading from verse 15. The word of God makes us to understand that God requires that which is past. And that all the things we have done, and all the things we're doing, if we do not take to record that God requires the past, then we'll just be doing them. And just be going through life, going through the motions of life. And not understanding that God will require everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm reading there from verse 15. It says, that which has been is now. And that which is to be has already been. Look at this. And God requires that which is past. God requires that which is past. All those things we have done and we have swept under the carpet. And we think no man knows, no woman knows. My husband will never know this one. My wife will never see this one. The leaders in the church will never, they'll never discover this one. And then we thought everything is over. In the sight of the Lord, it's not over. God requires that which is past. I pray as we see what God requires, will bring everything open to the table. And the Lord himself will make everything right now that we have the chance to have our sins blotted out. And we're not covering anything. Whatever the consequence here on earth is only on earth. When we get to the other side, if there are things we're deliberately, carefully, studiously covering up, 
we know that when we get over there face to face it will come for the children of uh, Jacob it came eventually and they said look at it now all those things that we did is being required of us we must have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and then it says and our bodies washed with pure water look at verse 23 in verse 23 let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promise then in verse 24 it says and let us consider one another to provoke unto love let us consider one another to provoke, not to provoke unto anger, not to provoke unto malice. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love, to provoke the man, the woman, the one nearest to you, the one that you come across, provoke them to loving God and provoke them to loving the ministry, the word of God, their ministry, and not provoke them to weakness and provoke them to discouragement and to provoke them to heartlessness. Consider that if you are going to do anything at all, here is a Joseph, he has revealed the dream. Provoke provoke him to love let him love God let him continue serving God with all his heart all his soul and all his mind so that the dream that God has given will be fulfilled after all Judah Simeon Levi after all even if you don't encourage Joseph don't lift him up and don't provoke him to the achievement of the dream. The dream will still come true. Your dream will still come true. And so Joseph was not looking at the people that provoked him and sent him off to go and die in Egypt. He was looking at God and the God that supported him and he himself he kept a clean conscience. He kept a pure conscience. He didn't do anything to hide away from Potiphar. All right, you are the one offering yourself to me. I believe since you are the one, you're not going to report to your husband to Potiphar. All right, let's go ahead. He would have had a defiled conscience. A dirty conscience, a depraved conscience, a disappointing conscience. But no, he kept himself the way he ought to keep himself. And then uh, there's nothing to condemn his conscience. He could stand straight and he could look at those brothers and say, you have not done it. You didn't intend to send me to Egypt to come and rule. You intended to send me to Egypt to come and die. Here is the dream fulfilled. I am Joseph. You have not done it. God sent me here to preserve life. I pray your conscience will remain clean. Will remain pure. And if there is anything that needs to be put right and corrected, God will help you. You'll not be looking at men. If I tell that, if I say that, so and so will be affected, such and such will be affected. Well, if you keep quiet because of this or that, on the final day, God requires the past. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three concerning the concern of the father and his worries. The concern of 
the father and his worries. In Genesis chapter 42, I'm reading from verse 38, and he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead. Be careful how you repeat what other people say. There are many people that trade in lies. And if you repeat what they say, you'll be telling lies yourself. Jacob said his brother is dead on the basis of the lies they are told him. And he is left, Benjamin is left alone. If this, if mischief befall him, by the way, in the which he go, then shall ye bring down my gray ears with sorrow to the grave. Look at chapter 44, and I'm reading from verse 27. Chapter 44, verse 27, and the servant, thy servant, my father said unto us, Ye know that my wife bear me two sons. Verse 28, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn in pieces. And I saw him not since. Now, Judah, what do you say about Joseph? He's not, he's dead. When somebody tells himself something wrong, something false over and over and over, he himself now believes that. And these brothers of Joseph, they actually believe because they are told themselves over and over, he is dead, he is gone. Are you telling yourself something false? If I sin, I still get to heaven. God loves me. That's eternal security. And you tell yourself over and over And because of that Whatever you are hearing in the word of God You don't believe You don't believe the whole Bible You're saying I can sin I can do whatever The pastor does not understand That the love of God continues forever And God loves me unconditionally No, Jesus didn't say that It's because you tell yourself The lie over and over you've come to believe the lie now and Judah now telling Joseph what they are told the father and what they themselves believe surely he is torn in pieces and I saw him not since and then he tells us in verse 29 and if ye take this also from me and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray ears with sorrow to the grave. Now, the worry and the anxiety that Jacob had because of what they had said now, we have to take Benjamin and we have to go. Otherwise, the man will not see us. Look at three things. Say number one, the forgetful father fed with warm wood. They had fed him or something poisonous. They had fed him with warm wood and bitter gall. And because he was depending on that, that's why he was now worried and anxious. Number two, the fearful father full of worries. Number three, our fruitful faith focused on the word. Let's look at number one. Number one, the forgetful father fed with one word. It tells us in Genesis chapter 42, reading from verse 36, and Jacob their father said unto them, Me, have ye bereaved of my children? Joseph is not. 
they keep on repeating uh, that same thing because they had fetched their father with one word joseph is not and simeon is not and ye take and ye will take benjamin away all these things are against me look at verse 37 it says and reuben spake unto his father saying slay my two sons now reuben who do you think jacob is that he will slay his own grandchildren slay my two sons if i bring him not to thee deliver him into my hand and i will bring him to thee again verse 38 in verse 38 and he said my son shall not go down with you reuben i don't trust you unstable as waters it cannot excel reuben don't give me that kind of promise your character doesn't give me the assurance you'll make your word come true my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead jacob kept on repeating what they told what uh, what they symbolized when they gave showed him the clothes of many colors he slept alone if mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go then shall ye bring down my gray ears or sorrow to the graves now he forgot himself what the Lord had told him. And because he exalted the one word that he was fed with above the word of God. That's the reason why he kept on saying what he said. Ezekiel chapter 13, reading from verse 22. Because Ezekiel 13, 22, please open your Bible. Because with lies have ye made the heart of the righteous sad. All those uh, brothers of Joseph, with lies, they made the heart of their father Jacob sad. Are you like that? You claim to be a christian born again saved you claim to be sanctified and holy it's your life that will tell have you come to the point that with lies you make the heart of the righteous sad you see that man or that woman so happy so joyful now let me concord something conjure something and cook something out and tell him i know this will get him let me send this kind of text to him and this will get him he appears to be on top of the world let me show him this and this will bring him down with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad whom I have not made such and strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. A wicked person, a sinful person, a backsliding person has done something that will land him in hellfire. And you are not helping him to repent. You tell him and you show him, well, that doesn't matter. Everybody has his, uh, you know, problem. Everybody has his own but you, you have done that. Forget about it and go your way. They make the wicked happy. They make the wicked and they say, you know, so and so is very nice, a good person. Although I know, according to the word of God, I should have been nailed. I should have been disciplined. I should have gone through this or that. But you know, once the case gets to so and so, it's always just a nice person. It's preparing you for hellfire. 
that you are not able to repent of the evil that you have done because he's strengthening your hands as a wicked man as a wicked woman that you should not return from your wicked way by promising you life i pray that god will help us so that we will stand straight with a clear conscience with a pure conscience and we will not lie to anybody make the righteous sad make the wicked happy will stand by the word of god all the days of our lives in jesus name amen we're coming to number two here number two the fearful father full of worries the fearful father full of worries all these many years since joseph led none of those brothers they were discussing with their father they were interacting together none of those people ever opened their mouth it was like a conspiracy it was like signing a covenant with the devil nobody will tell nobody will talk nobody will reveal well everything will still come out and on the final day when we get up there you will be alone before the heavenly father all the things we have covered all the things we have concealed all the things we we'll say ah when a covenant and i will not be the one to reveal something like this because we're not ready to change and if we're not changing and we go to report ourselves that this this and this if we do that again they will know that that's the person who's telling the lie because of that they will not say anything there's no Christianity there and there's no righteousness there it's just religion it's like religion where we're coming from and we thought we had repented and we had abandoned the ways of evil but the conspiracy the covenant with evil to cover up is still there I pray that the Lord will help us and make us understand that God requires the past and we by the grace of God we live as we ought to live we're not living in lies and deception and hypocrisy look at Genesis chapter 43 I'm reading from verse 1 and the famine was so in the land look at verse 2 it says in verse 2 and it came to pass when they had eaten of the corn which they had brought out of Egypt their father said unto them go again and buy us a little food in verse 3 it says in verse 3 and Judah spake unto him saying the man did solemnly protest unto us saying ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you look at verse 13 in verse 13 it tells us take also your brother and arise go again unto the man then in verse 14 it says and god almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and benjamin if i be bereaved of my children i am bereaved they saw the father talking they knew he was referring to you know the bereavement he had in the case of joseph but they'll not open their mouth and say daddy you know we love you and our love will make us now to open up actually what happened we're not sure whether he died or he didn't die this is what actually happened i wonder what happened when eventually jacob got to egypt and he saw joseph joseph my son you're still alive yes daddy i'm still alive and all the years because he spent 17 years after 
he got to Egypt. All those 17 years, and Joseph was very close to Jacob. And Joseph must have said, Daddy, what did they tell you when they got back home on that fateful day? And then the father will say, this is what they told me. And Joseph will say, can I tell you what really happened? And eventually J Jacob knew, we will know the truth at last. I said, we will know the truth at last. I can't hear you. The lies people have told the deception people have covered we will know at last we're going to be hundreds and thousands and millions and trillions of years in heaven and all the things that you know people cover here covered there there's nothing to cover when we get over there for you to have the peace of mind and the joy of living with the lord be with the lord this is the time to clear your record and wipe your slate so that all those hidden things, nothing is following after you, nothing is haunting you. You really have a conscious voyage of offense towards God and towards man. And let them just say, Amen. Amen. Look at chapter 44 and verse 30. Chapter 44, verse 30. Now, therefore, when I come to my servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound in the lad's life. Reading verse 31. It shall come to pass when you see it that the lad is not with us, that he will die. Judah. Simeon, do you really love your father? You don't want him to die in sorrow? He will die. You should have done the right thing. Are you covering up? And thy servant shall bring down the gray ears of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. You see, the father himself being fearful, he had forgotten the word that the Lord had given to him before. When we forget the word of promise, the word of prophecy that the Lord had given us before, and then we dwell on the words of men and on the insinuations of men, it makes our hearts unnecessarily to be trouble but we're told in uh, Isaiah chapter 51 reading from verse 13 it says and forgettest the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and has feared continually every day when we forget the God of heaven, we fear continually every day. And because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Isaiah chapter 57, we're reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 11. And of whom hast thou been afraid of fear? Whom are you afraid of? Jacob, what are you afraid of? Brother, sister, minister, worker, children of God, what are you afraid of? What makes you to live your heart, your life in fear? That you are not thinking of the word of promise of the Lord. Of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? That thou hast lied. Oh. It's fear that makes people to lie. Fear of man. Fear of woman. Fear of what they will say. Fear of what they will do. Do that's what makes them to lie. They lie with words of mouth, they lie in action, they lie with body language that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me, not laid each to the heart, to thy heart, have not I held my peace even of old, and thou 
fearest me not is because we don't fear God anyone who lies that's why he lies look at number three here number three here is talking about a fruitful faith focused on the word a faith should be uh, fi fixed focused placed on the word of God Hebrews chapter 4 reading from verse 2 Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it the word does not profit except it's mixed with faith in the heart of those who have heard in romans chapter 10 verse 17 so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god look at the other side of that coin so then fear cometh by hearing and hearing by the words of men when we hear the words of men and we're too familiar with the words of men and we think through on the words of men and the words of men steal away from us the word of God we're hearing fear will come God had spoken to Jacob before any of these children were born now these children have come and have fed him what lies and he had forgotten the word of God and because he had forgotten the word of God that's why fear lodged and dwelt in his heart but as we come and we realize today and we wake up that faith will take the preeminence in our heart we drop the words of men we overlook the words of men we cleanse our heart from the words of men and then we concentrate on the word of God so then faith cometh by hearing hearing by the word of God Hebrews chapter 11 verse 27 in Hebrews chapter 11 reading from verse 27 by faith they forsook egypt that's moses not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing him who is invisible when we see him who is invisible we see god the god of abraham the god of isaac and the god of jacob when we see him who is invisible and we concentrate on his word faith will abide in our lives and everything we do and everywhere we go and everything we undertake we do by faith because we're not even thinking of the words of the sons of jacob it may appear true but no if it's different from the word of god we're not going to believe that we believe the Lord and we're able to endure and we're able to continue what we need to do as if we had seen and we're seeing him who is invisible. I pray that that kind of faith will develop in every one of our lives in Jesus name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has spoken to us today as what we need to do how we need to believe how we need to stand on the word of god every time whatever you see whatever you hear whatever you are told and whatever people demonstrate or reveal to you you stand on the word of god by the word of god and you'll succeed in what he has called you to do in jesus name live by faith and live a sieve you see the invisible and your life will be according to the planning of god in jesus name